Okay, the first question is, true or false, Abraham never doubted. God, uh, Abraham never doubted God, is, is the question. And I think the links are working in YouTube again, so I will post that in <clears throat> chat, and hopefully everyone will uh, cast their vote. Okay, um, I guess I'll go first, if you don't mind. It's um, I remember um, this, uh, remember when we had the, the problem with this, what they called the doubtless gospel, and uh, fortunately, uh, that's uh, no longer part of CES, but there was an argument uh, uh, in the past about uh, uh, people, do, do people ever doubt, uh, and uh, are there any cases in the Bible where people have doubts about their salvation, or and uh, one of the things that came up was, uh, well, in the Bible, uh, well, certainly the book of Galatians is about people who go into apostasy. They're real believers, and, and yet they get led astray into a, kind of a lordship salvation where they, it's faith in Jesus plus practice in Judaism. Uh, and, so, and then there's many other cases. Um, uh, and and uh, there was um, between... Uh, the different parties, they were arguing about it, if some of the significant uh, people in the Bible ever had any doubts. Uh, and this is one of the points that was brought up then. And I, I believe that uh, um, Abraham and uh, Sarah, before, um, before um, uh, Isaac was born, uh, they reached a point where they doubted God, uh, and God promised that they would have uh, a, ch a child, and it would uh, lead to a uh, offspring to be a, a great nation uh, and a, a, a blessing to the whole world. So this was a promise from God, and I remember God stating it um, more than once, but uh, when Sarah got to be, I think, 90 years old, and uh, Abraham was a hundred years old, and she'd been she was barren, and you know women reach a point where they physiologically change, and they're no longer able to have children, and that was the case. So you can understand a person thinking, well, it's impossible. I can't have any children now. So Sarah, uh, she convinced Abraham that, uh, well, let's take this into our own hands. Uh, and do it ourselves. We, we can have a child if we use our handmaiden, Hagar, and they ended up with Ishmael. But even though Ishmael was the firstborn from Abraham, that was not God's plan. God had uh, Isaac in, in mind. So, but I think what led to that problem was uh, uh, Sarah, she doubted, she convinced Abraham, he doubted God. And uh, so I would answer, yes, uh, it is true that there was a time when uh, uh, Abraham and even and Sarah, his wife, were undoubted. Okay, who'd like to go next? I would. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to jump in for it. Somebody else got to it before me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I disagree in, in this regard, Brother Luke. I, I respect your opinion on that. And I think years ago, I probably would have said the same thing. But I spent a lot of time thinking about that, probably not even that long ago that I was really meditating on this whole concept of whether or not Abraham doubted. I don't think he did. I don't think Sarah did. And here's why. Because I think the proof is in what they named Ishmael. Had they thought for a minute that this was really going to be the seed of promise and it was doubt, which means to disbelieve God is going to make the provision. They wouldn't have named that boy Ishmael. What they got was impatient. And, and, and we've all done this. We believe God when he tells us something, but we don't want to wait. <laughs> we, we, we get impatient and we want to hurry and we want to help God along. Well, I believe you, God, but now I'm going to come up with my own, <laughs> my own way of, of, of making this happen. You know, for example, if the Lord tell you, I'm going to put you in ministry. And maybe you're 20 years old, if you think back, 20 years old, and you go, okay, and you get excited and you're on fire, but you didn't know that your ministry wasn't going to start for another 30 years. 
He might not tell you that fact. He might not say your ministry is going to start at 50. He just say, you're called, you're going to do, but you don't know that the calling is now going to be the preparation for the equipment, <laughs> the equipping and, and the grooming and the training and the learning and all of that. So even though you might be called at 20, your ministry don't begin till you're 50. Okay, I'm just giving this as an example. So this is the same thing that happened to them. He told them, they believed him, but they get impatient. And they're like, I, I'm going to help God out. Let's come up, let's do this. But the proof was they didn't name that baby uh, Isaac. They could have, but they didn't. And they knew what that child's name was supposed to be. So they named him Ishmael because this was their, this was them getting the gratification for their flesh. They wanted a child. And we see the problems that they ended up created. And they realized their error, <laughs> helping God out. As I say, God, you know, he don't bless no mess, but he'll clean it up. And then uh, we, we see what happened. Even in that, even in their error, blessing to bring in a whole nother lineage of people into the earth. But um, that being said, Isaac was the seed of promise and they didn't name that child or even try or attempt or had to be rebuked for trying to name him Isaac. They didn't even attempt it. They named him Ishmael. They knew that wasn't the seed of promise. That's why I, I believe that they didn't doubt. They just decided we're going to help you along, God, because you're moving too slow <laughs> and we're going to do it our way. And, and you see the results. So that's my opinion on that. All right. Thank you. Um, well, uh, you know, we we're trying to give a, an initial answer uh, that is concise. And then after everybody's had a turn, we can all have a chance for a follow up where we could uh, ex expand our answer. And in the follow up, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Lisa, um, I, I thought your question was very interesting, but I, I don't remember the meanings of the names uh, Ishmael and Isaac. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what it means and, and how why that's relevant. Uh, in the follow-up. Uh, okay, Angel, how about you? What do you say? Well, um, so I would say what, I, what Sister Lisa said is, is a good point that I've actually uh, thought before. I thought about how, you know, like what really constitutes doubting God and like, you know, what really, really doubting. And I think, you know, that impatience does explain um, a lot of Abraham and Sarah's actions at the same time. Um, in a way, it's still the same thing because, because uh, I, I run into this dilemma with myself um, about my own, you know, I, there's no question that what I believe, uh, you know, that, that, that I believe the Bible is true, that God is, um, you know, uh, good and merciful and that I am saved uh, 100%. And I, and, and I ultimately, I trust him in all ways. However, when it comes to those, uh, uh, like your actual real life decisions um, and like, you know, let's say, in 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 uh, you know Abraham's case, it was a very uh, extraordinary situation. But you know he had this promise from God, which is similar to how we have certain promises from God in Scripture that apply to us as believers. Um, and you know we know that they're true, but because we're impatient, or because like we're, you know we try to hurry something along or do something of our own will in our own way, and in a way that really is that's doubting that God knows best and that that His ultimate plan and his outcome if he does it without your your help is going to actually uh, end up being better for you and is actually going to be what you, you know like a, a, a unimaginably better outcome than you could have ever uh you know uh, strived for in your own will so i think that um uh it what she, you know what lisa said is very true but i think it like if you look deeper it is sort of like doubting that god knows best because if, if you're doubting his timing, for instance, you know, because I'm sure they, they believe that he would deliver on his promise, but they were impatient because they were doubting about, you know, uh, when, uh, like whether it was going to be soon enough and whether, you know, uh, his way was going to be the best way and the most satisfying and the most, uh, um, uh, I guess, yeah, well, yeah, I guess it's satisfying is the best way to put it. Like, and, and I just, I struggle with this all the time in my own life because of just trying to discern the difference between, you know, seeing God uh, kind of work something out in my life. So the way, I'll give you an example. Um, like Joel recently got promoted to, uh, he's like this, the, the head of the maintenance department at, the, a, at this big apartment complex that he worked at for like 10 years. And they, um, you know, and now he's kind of doing regional stuff too. 
but initially we thought it was going to just be a nightmare. Like we thought the job would kill him because his boss and close friend had that position and that's who he'd been working under. And he was just a mess. I mean, it was, he was in the hospital for like heart attack. His job was so stressful. And there was so much infighting between like the office ladies and the maintenance guys and all this weird subterfuge going on. Joel just, he couldn't imagine, you know, living like it was, you know, with four kids and we don't have any help in family, like having this type of a stressful job, um, even it wouldn't be worth the money. Right. And, um, so, you know, he didn't actually uh, endeavor to get the position when Daniel quit. In fact, he thought he might end up quitting and getting a different job um, because he was dreading it so much. And now, so had Joel, um, let's say, you know, Daniel was offering to quit and just let him take the position for like a couple of years before this happened. But Joel never uh, urged him to do that. He was just kind of patient about it. But had he, had he gotten impatient, you know, especially because he's making so much more money now than he was then, you know, and we really needed it having uh, uh, this expanding family. Had he gotten impatient at the time and not waited until everything just came together without him even trying, um, he it would have been a nightmare job because what happened was Daniel quit um, because they got a new property manager. And Daniel, for some reason, had this horrible impression of her and thought that she was just going to be the worst. And he refused to work with her because he'd been there 30 years. And he just, I guess he just, it was a complete misunderstanding. We still don't know how they had such a misunderstanding because she's amazing. She's like an awesome, awesome person. And as soon as, um, you know, Joel actually got to where he could actually sit down and talk to her, they hit it off so well and she doesn't even she doesn't even consider her uh to be his boss or you know herself to be his boss she lets him run everything on the maintenance side and uh, in just like six months the apartment complex is uh basically on the score like that the company grades everything on it's like the top complex in terms of how it runs its occupancy all of that stuff um and the maintenance stuff <laughs> definitely in just six months and all that disharmony and all the drama and all that stuff that was happening with you know the old staff is completely gone and this was all god I, and i know that because none of us you know, we, we didn't try to uh, you know make any of this happen it just kind of happen and he went with it uh, but had he done this earlier had he tried to take daniel's position earlier um it would have been a nightmare still because we would have had that older prop the old property manager which she was a big source of all the problems um, but uh, he, but Joel didn't know that. He really didn't understand that things just weren't being done properly. In fact, Daniel was really not, <laughs> he wasn't communicating. He, it, like Daniel and the old property manager, they were kind of the problem. That's why everything was kind of such a mess. And um, this is just like, it was a lesson for me because uh, although we weren't really that tempted to force the issue uh, and, and like take Daniel's offer up like years ago when he was just going to quit just for Joel's sake. Um, seeing how and this has happened repeatedly in our lives especially you know in the past five years since i've been a believer i've seen this where well it's been five years since yes, i could lose track of my years <laughs> um i'm just gonna tell about five now um i've seen this repeatedly just the difference in outcome when um when you trust when you just kind of give it over to god as opposed to how i always used to be which is always trying to control outcomes and i see what Abraham did as a, as an attempt to control outcomes. And so, although I do think he, he believes God would deliver eventually and that he did get impatient, I think that that in itself is doubting God's wisdom uh, about when the best time is and what will, you know, like, I think sometimes we doubt that God wants us to be as happy as we want ourselves to be, right? <laughs> I think that's kind of what we, we, we think that, that, uh, you know, he'll be kind of like a wet blanket compared to what we uh, we want for ourselves and our, our little like schemes that we work up and things that we're really, you know, we get on kick about something and we think that God isn't as excited about whatever it is as we are. He does, you know, he, he has, like, that's why he takes so long sometimes or he, you know, to deliver things, but really he makes everything work out in a way where you wouldn't even imagine how happy that you were, you know, <laughs> that you were going to end up being like, even as you were daydreaming about whatever outcome you were trying to achieve, you weren't actually imagining being as happy as you end up being when God is the one who brings it to fruition. That's at least in, in my experience, so. Okay, thank you. All right, Sister Heather. Um, yes, I think, you know. Wait, I, 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 was that your question, Heather? 
I don't remember. Um, oh, I know okay. that I know that there's no, one in there mine. that is. It was oh, okay. okay. All right, then, because I, I, I didn't want you to have to go last. It's not your question. Go ahead, sister. All right. So um, I've 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 agreed and disagreed with with a lot of what everybody has said. Um, I, you know, Sister Lisa and I normally steal each other's thoughts, but not tonight, um, which is a good thing sometimes. But I, I do think that that they doubted. And um, I think that Sarah doubt. I think that Abraham doubted. Um, and let me do that first, that part first. The doubt that I see in Abraham is this. He he left his homeland to go to a land that God sent him to and had no idea where he was going, what he was going to do there. Um, and when he was coming into Egypt because there was a famine in the land, he lied to Pharaoh and said that that Sarah was his sister because he doubted, even if a little bit doubted the protection that he knew that he would have because God was the one who called him on this journey. Good point, Heather. So yes, he did doubt there. Um, and then after everything else that they had gone through, um, they, they, um, they did the same exact thing. Oh my goodness. I can't, I'm trying to remember the other King's name, but, um, there was another King right before Isaac was born that they, they go in. And again, um, he says, this is my sister. And you know what? I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Because if they are allowed to mess up, even if even just that little bit, then thank God, because that means I'm allowed to mess up even just a little bit, you know. Um, and as far as um, with Abraham and Sarah, I I have read through um, this portion of scripture a lot because I'm I'm very much an Old Testament junkie when it comes to the Bible stories. Um, and. One one thing that I've noticed is that God never mentioned Sarah in the promise. Never. Until right before, like the year before Isaac was born. It was always about Abraham. It was Abraham's seed and Abraham's descendants will become like the stars. And God always spoke directly to Abraham, never mentioned Sarah's name until a year before Isaac was born. So Sarah, I can imagine being a wife, keeps hearing these reports from her husband of how God has told me this and God is, has um, promised this. And I know because I, I, have, I have been in that position where you hear these great things, but you don't see your own self in the future, in, in the promise. So you set yourself aside out of love for your husband and out of love for the Lord and out of trust of that somehow this is going to work, even if it doesn't include you. And she promoted her handmaid to take the place of the child's mother, not knowing that God had a blessing for her too. Because years later, after Ishmael was about 13 years old, God showed up and, and in person and told her that she was going to, well, told Abraham and she heard that she was going to be the mother of the promised child. And she laughed about it because she did not believe it. And then out of fear, denied that she had laughed. And the Lord said, yes, you did laugh. That laughter to me was disbelief. So did Abraham doubt? Yes, he did. Did Sarah doubt? Yes, she did. Is it okay that they doubted? Absolutely. Were they still saved in the end? They would not be listed in the Hall of Fame in in Hebrews if they were not saved. Okay, that settles it then. <laughs> okay, um, just that was a joke. A good answer though, but we still have yet to hear from Ben who wrote the question. So Ben must have the right answer, right, Ben? Let's hope so. No. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm probably going to take a slightly different take as most people do, as I usually do. But um, and some of the things I'm probably going to say, people are probably going to say, "Oh, Ben, you're taking it too far," and I'm I'm convinced I'm not. Um, again, I think the Bible puts things in the things that stand out in the Bible, like a sore thumb, or that 
cause you to check uh, yourself or wh what you're reading. I think I put there for a reason, so you'll stop and consider. I think a lot of times uh, believers, you know, when they're reading it, they fail to, to consider, okay, what was the motivation of the person who was saying that? What was God's motivation? What was the person's motivation? What were the circumstances? And again, I, I try to pierce as deeply as I can and, and squeeze as much juice out of Scripture as I can. And uh, I think there are some occasions where uh, uh, Abraham doubted. And I'm not going to uh, cite the ones that um, that were already cited. But uh, if you just take the first example of, of Abraham being declared righteous, it's in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 9. And I'll just quickly read those. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. This is before he was called Abraham, but Abram. In a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my own house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and, and he accounted it for him, to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought out these things to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in two. So a couple things that, that I think are important to, that, that are important about this passage uh, again, it's, it's, it's the verse that people always go to that uh, where Abraham was accounted for righteousness, which is, again, justification, uh, which is salvation, eternal salvation. A couple things. One is, uh, Abraham, when God said, uh, promise him an heir, he did not say it's going to come from Sarai or Sarah. He just said, it's gonna come, I'm going to give you an heir from your own body. So, it, you know, not so when he... he uh, took things into his own hands with Hagar, uh, he didn't it wasn't necessarily an act of disbelief. I mean, I, I don't have a problem with people saying that. I'm just saying uh, it being, you know, a critical person who's going to come, you know, devil's advocate, not that I would ever advocate for the devil, uh, but if I were to be devil's advocate, some people would say, well, you know, hey, well, he didn't necessarily doubt. He was uh, just taking things into his own hands. And, you know, they may or may not have a case there. But um, like I said, it was only that God only told them up to that point that it was going to come from your own body, not from which which wife. One, no, that's number one. Um, number two, and this is kind of minor. Uh, again, just throwing this out there. It's not part of my case at all. But when God said that, you know, I want you to, you know, get yourself up and and uh, go to a land where I will show you, uh, you know, you know, uh, leave your family. Uh, he didn't necessarily leave his family. His father came with them and Lot came with them. So some people could say, well, that was an act of doubt. Or an act of disobedience because he didn't leave his family behind, but he took some with him. Um, again, this minor. But here's the thing I really wanted to get to. Um, this, I think, is profound. And I don't think, again, I'm reading too much into this whatsoever. Um, I think this is a put in there for a very, very uh, good reason. Uh, because Abraham is is the, uh, the example for us put up in Scripture as the person, you know, the champion of faith. Uh, but again, even he, I believe, was... A man just like us, and a nature with a nature just like ours, and he doubted just like everyone else. Um, the difference is is that he believed the right message at the right time. Uh, it, it, you know, so it only takes a momentary act of faith. And if you listen here, if you what, read this passage carefully, he says, you know, when when he again he's asked, telling God, hey, I, I have no offspring, I have no heir, and God says, well, look to heaven. Again, look look to the heavenly, look to the eternal. He looked to the heavenly, looked to the eternal, looked to the stars, which are a picture of, you know, uh, you know, we're all essentially going to, Jesus said that we're all going to be, uh, we're all going to shine like the right in righteousness, like the stars. 
it's it's a picture of uh it's our type of of the heavenly uh life essentially in fact the ancient world believed the stars were living uh they they saw that they uh they, they saw that they moved and things like that and they, they they actually thought they were living so anyways abraham is looking to the stars he sees the stars god says you so so will your descendants be and elsewhere in scripture he says your set descendants will be at the sand of the, the sand of the uh as many as this, your descendants will be as great as the sand, the grains of sand or whatever. But that's later on. I'll get into that in a second. But um, again, the this that he's looking to the heaven. He says, "Look now towards heaven. Count the stars, if you're able to number them. So shall your descendants be." So Abraham believed that, and so again, he was looking to heaven. He saw the stars, and he says, "So your shall your descendants be." So God, right there, is promising him that. Uh, he's promising a continuance of life, essentially, or, a, you know, he, he's promising him uh, a blessing. He's giving him a blessing uh, in relation to uh, continued life. Um, and so, again, it's, it's a type for uh, the gospel. Okay, so, again, he, he and so it's right, it says, uh, so shall your descendants be, and then right next sentence it says, and he believed the Lord, and he accounted him for righteousness. So, Abraham didn't try to wiggle with it and say, well, what about this, what about that? Now, he just believed that God counted his righteousness. So he's lo he's looking into the stars. Again, he's looking into the heavenly. I think, again, it's a picture of him being in the spirit, essentially. But right after that, I think he flips, flipped right back into his flesh. Because he the next promise, he says, Then he said to him, uh, God said, I am the Lord who brought you out of, the, out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. So now God's switching it into the earthly. And then, and then Abraham said, Lord God, how shall I know I shall inherit it? Why did he say that to his previous uh, promise about how your son shall be? He didn't ask any questions. He just believed him. But now, again, he, he's slipping into the flesh like the Jew. It's a picture of the Jew, but also any believer that slips into the flesh. How will I know I should inherit it? You know, he, he, he's questioning God. He's he's doubting God. And so God said to him, bring me to Heifer, etc. So he, he God says, again, he's flipping back into his flesh. Now he's insisting that God, uh, you know, he's walking by sight, now Lord walking by faith, and he's saying, okay, well, I'm going to do this ritual, fancy ritual, uh, with uh, with this covenant where I'm going to, you know, something needs to die. Um, and, and again, when, it, when in the ancient world, when they did covenants, both parties offered a sacrifice, and they would walk in between the cut pieces to indicate this is what's going to happen or what should happen to either party should they break the terms of the covenant. So, again, I think... You seek after a sign. Exactly. That's exactly my point. And, uh, and so, again, I think, I think this is very, this is very curious. You know, get, he didn't, didn't make any qualms or, you know, uh, any fuss about, uh, again, so shall your descendants be. Uh, but when it comes to land, uh, that's, that's far more significant. Or, I mean, he, again, he, he, he slipped right back in the flesh and walked, walked by sight. So I think that is a clear indication that Abraham flipped, uh, flipped back into the flesh, just like we all do. Um, number two, um, uh, okay, like I mentioned before, Sarah, uh, he, God never said what, 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 um, what wife he would give him, give, uh, provide him a, a descendant. Um, but in Genesis 17, 15 through 19, uh, it says, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, again, this is the next chapter. Uh, and, and I, I think several decades had, had transpired, uh, as Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and give you a son by her. So that's his first instance of he saying even that she's going to give you the son. She's going to give you the descendants that are going to be as the number of the stars, uh, whereas Ishmael's descendants are going to be the, of the sand, of the, uh, of the sand. Again, that's an earthly thing. Um, and then he said, I will bless her, and she'll have be a mother of nations, kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And again, he's thinking this to him into himself. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. So God is even saying, no, uh, uh, How can this be? I, I, I'm, a, I'm 100 years old. Sarah's 90 years old. And God, just use Ishmael. Make, I, I, don't trust, I don't trust that you're going to make you're going to uh make a, uh this future child uh 
Like they, I don't, I, I can't believe that Sarah is going to have a child. You already had, you already gave me Ishmael. So why don't you just make this blessing, this covenant of, of, um, you know, the, the suddenness being the number of the stars of the, of the sky. Why don't you make that on Ishmael? And then God said, "No, Sarah, your wife shall bear shall bear you a son, and you shall name his call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him." So again, when P Ishmael, by the way, means means he laughs. And again, uh, Sarah laughed when she heard the news. Uh, Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And people laugh when they when they hear something absurd. You, you know, he doubted. I believe he doubted because he thought it was impossible. And just in case. Um. Uh, and, just, and again, in the old in the Old Testament, when a blessing was bestowed on somebody, it was irrevocable. Just like uh, when Esau was uh, blessed, I'm sorry, Jacob was blessed in, uh, instead of Esau. You know, it wasn't like uh, Isaac could say, "Oh, I, that made a mistake. You tricked me." No, it was it was irrevocable. Just like the gifts and calling of God are without repentance or irre irrevocable. When a blessing was made, it was forever. It was no taking it back. And that's why uh, Esau cried with many tears. It says it says in Hebrews, but he found no repentance, even though he did uh, sought it diligently diligently with tears. Because he knew there was no giving it back. Once a, once a once a covenant is cut or a, a blessing is made, there's it's irrevocable. That's what it, way, way it was in the ancient world. It was it was sacred, unlike you know our profane society. Um, and so I believe again, I, uh, I Abraham knew that the irrevocability of it, and that's why he said, "No, I don't want I don't want to trust you and and, and wait on uh, Isaac to be born for you to confirm this covenant to bestow this blessing. I want you to give it to Ishmael now." So I again, I I believe that's a clear um, indication. Again, looking at motivation, look at all the things, the, the, the dynamics of the story. It's a clear indication that God, uh, 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 Abraham doubted God in both th that case with Ishmael and with um, with regards to looking at the stars and uh, you know saying, oh, how shall I know I should shall inherit it when it comes to the land? Again, that was walking by sight thinking about the earthly things, a picture of the Jew, a picture of the flesh that wants to walk by sight, as opposed to looking at the heavenly and trusting and believing and not requiring any covenant be cut or just taking God at his word. It, I think it's a clear example of God taking God as a word as opposed to making God uh, uh, obligate himself through some uh, covenant. So I thought that was interesting. All right, thank you. All right, everybody's had a turn so we can have a, a follow up, um, Lisa. Would you uh, answer my question about the names? I mean, I, I, after what Ben said, I I'm recalling now that uh, I'd forgotten that uh, Ishmael had already been born and been named when uh, this other occasion uh, where Abraham was uh, uh, his it was the question is did he doubt God at that point when they Sarah laughed, and he's negotiating with God. So, I I think I understand the significance of the names now. But uh, it seems like Ishmael was already named. And it was, go ahead, Elisa. Okay, um, Isaac means laughter, as has been pointed out, and Ishmael means, uh, depending on how you work it out, either God, the God that hears or uh god will hear okay now um which is exactly what ended up happening when sarah excuse me when hagar cried out in the desert god did hear them and answered her cry and blessed uh ishmael just as he had promised abraham he would do but uh i i heard everything that ben said very very good breakdown I think I misunderstood the question in this regard. I thought we were specifically talking about as to whether or not Abraham and Sarah doubted God, not ever in life, but specifically concerning the promise of Isaac. So the way that I answered the question was based on that. And I explained why I believed I don't see that they truly doubted him. I think they wanted to help God out and hurry along, and they came up with their own way of bringing about a son, but that ultimately the proof that they did not believe that that this was the seed of promise was that they did not name him Isaac. 
Now, if uh, you go back and look in Genesis 18, that's where Sarah actually ends up laughing because she's listening when the visitation comes and the Lord declares that Abraham is going to have a son. And that's when she laughed because she knew how old she was and how old he was. And I know it must have seemed an incredibly strange thing to them. I get that. But I do believe that they believed God. They just, as we would say, stumbled or we call it wavering. It's like um, you believe something, but it's you, you, how, how would I want to phrase this? You, it's over here on pause, but you're going to do your own thing kind of thing. It's not that you disbelieve God. That's why I pointed out it's like their way of trying to move things along by their own extrapolations. And every time we've ever done that, even in our own lives as believers, that's when we mess stuff up because God don't need our help. We're just supposed to wait on the Lord. And they decided we're going to help God out. And they came up with their own plan. Now, as far as Abraham not knowing who the seed was going to come from, I disagree because he did not have a concubine until after Sarah died, with the exception of them both agreeing that he would take Hagar based on their customs. It was permitted. And he decided, okay, I'll take Hagar and make a son. If you go back and read it, you'll see this is true. He didn't take up with any other woman after Hagar until after Sarah's death, which was Keturah. So um, I think he absolutely understood because he, he, Abraham wasn't a womanizer that his seed was going to come from Sarah. They were one flesh. They married. I think he knew it. But again, when you start talking about uh, when he was afraid for his life and things like that, that's a storm at the moment. And sometimes people can lose sight of things and they didn't keep focus on what the promise was or they wouldn't have, have wavered at that moment. I think he absolutely believed God and then it was going to happen. And I don't think he ever did waver in that. But we can we can waver on other things in life. We do it as believers. Something happens. Uh, you lose your job. <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? Right. But you did not no longer believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You just wavering at that moment, forgetting your God is bigger than the storm at hand. So at that moment, you are doubting, but you're not ultimately doubting all of the promises of God. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to, to express it in this regard. And this is what I was talking about when I was considering how they they didn't even attempt to name that child something else. They they knew that they were promised this son. They knew that Isaac wasn't it. They knew it. Now, Abraham is a man. He loved his son. He loved Ishmael. Why wouldn't he? And when the, when the Lord said, yeah, you need to leave. When Sarah said, you need to send this bond woman away. Then the Lord came and explained exactly why Sarah was right. He said, yep, you do need to send him away. But don't worry, Abraham. I'm going to bless him. And Look what Abraham did. And this is powerful what he did. <laughs> he gives her, it shows you he believed God. What the Lord said, he believed him 100% because he took one, one loaf, one serving, one loaf of bread and one uh, bottle of water and gave it to her. And I remember thinking about this uh, years ago because I had discussed this with my dad. It's like, that's kind of cold blooded. Abraham will have all these sheep and all this different stuff. And how come he didn't give her all these other provisions? And my father said, well, I think it's two reasons. One, all that stuff really belonged to Isaac. He's the seed of promise. But two, he believed God that he was going to bless them and take care of them. So why would you need to give them anything more than just a day? If he's going to bless them and take care of them, no matter when they ran out, he's going to bless them and take care of them. So. That's why I'm saying it's like it depends on what we're talking about. Did they ever doubt? Sure, they did. But did they doubt uh, Isaac? I, I, I don't believe they did. So I explained why, but that's that's my position. Thank you for listening. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, all right. Well, I got a couple of follow-up questions, but let me see if anybody wants to expand any further on the original question. Anybody have more to say about that? Um, I actually wanted to comment. I think that, I think that Sister Lisa is correct. Um, I don't think they doubted on on um, Isaac once they once they knew the plan. But I I do I do think that um, well. Uh, I, I also disagree a little bit with what Ben said about um, not knowing which wife. According to their traditions in that time, if you were barren as a woman, it was completely accepted that you would give your husband, your handmaid, to have a baby for you. And that baby would be your own baby. It did not come from your body, but it was your baby. So Ishmael was the son of Sarah, just not born from her body. Um, According to their customs, Ishmael would have been born with Hagar sitting on Sarah's lap, making Ishmael, Ishmael Sarah's son, um, which is why when Jacob has children with his hand, with um, his wife's handmaids, um, the, the, the sons of uh, of um, Rachel, when when um, her handmaid gave birth, she uh, Rachel named that ba the first baby, and said, "God has given me a a child, ha has seen my misery or something like that, and given me a child, and it was a child of hers born through her handmaid." So, um, yeah, that in that in that sense, the child was Sarah's. But God said, "No, I'm not going to use your handmaid." I'm going to use you because to Sarah because you are the one who the the promised seed is meant to come through your body, not through your customs, basically. So um, that that was the only thing that I really wanted to add to that. Hmm. Okay. Uh, some of the uh, details that you provided uh, remind me of that. There's a TV show named the The Handmaid's Tale. I don't know if you've seen it. Maybe Heather. It sounds like maybe you did, but it's uh, they they use this um, this story about uh, Sarah and Hagar, and uh, that's one of the principles that it is uh, at play in uh, in this story. Uh, okay, does anybody have more to say about this before I uh, have a follow up question? Yeah, I'll just one other quick thing, Brother Luke. Uh, mm -hmm. Hebrews eleven. Uh, where it it speaks about this very thing about Abraham believing God concerning this promise and also Sarah that she absolutely did believe she's named in the hall of fame of faith as having believed and it is concerning uh, the seed of promise through Isaac so I would encourage everyone to read that as well okay thanks Ben you were saying something uh, I was just gonna make a couple quick points after after you make yours that's all well, I don't have points. I have follow-up questions uh, for everybody. Okay. Like, well, I, the qu okay, real quickly, I, I'll just say, um, again, I, I believe Abraham was a man of great faith. Uh, and I, I'm just saying, and, and I know there are verses in Romans and Hebrews that say that he did not waver in his faith and things like that, and he was fully persuaded. Um, I believe all that's true. Um, well, for, in the sense of wavering, uh, you know, I think it, it, that's the word of not wavering is kind of used in the same sense as that, uh, you know, that we're not blameless before God. You know, it doesn't mean you were perfect. It just means that, uh, you know, God wants us to be blameless before him. Not, not again, not sinless, but uh, constantly, uh, constantly growing, essentially. And uh, with regards to Abraham's not wavering, I, again, I think that just means, as in the, if you were general, generally to characterize his walk of faith, we would say that he did not waver. It's not like, he, you know, he ever threw on the towel and said, I'm, I don't. I disbelieve God. I do believe He probably did have momentary uh, doubts, and just like anyone else. But again, whenever He doubted, He would kind of dig, dig in, and and uh, get himself out of those doubts, and and or you know, just just like what you know. Any time I I I was not doubting at all anymore. But when years that I I I did doubt or feared I doubted, um, it would cause me to dig in and uh, uh, fortify my faith, and uh, and I think. Actually, that's a question coming up. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I, again, I don't, I don't dispute at all that Abraham was fully persuaded. Um, 
and that you know he didn't waver in his faith. But again, that didn't mean constant. It's just a, I think it's a general characteristic as his life went on, his lo- his trust and his faith in this world and other people diminished when his faith in God uh, increased over time. In that sense, it didn't waver. Uh, he never, you know, again, he never threw on the towel or whatever. He knew that God was in control and that even when he didn't understand, uh, especially with the sacrifice of Isaac, he, uh, God was still able to uh, keep his promises. Um, but I, again, I, I, I think there are cases where, like I've cited, there are moments where he, he did doubt. Um, and, um, and also do with regards to the wife, um, of the, where the child would come from. I guess the only way I, me- I wanted to mention that was that uh, I was saying that as it, as a case that uh, because he had uh, 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 a child through the Hagar, that doesn't necessarily mean that he doubted. I was kind of using uh, giving an argument for the opposite side, but either way, it doesn't matter. You were uh, being an advocate for the devil again, weren't you, Ben? I would never advocate for the devil. <laughs> That's not like something Lisa would say or what. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let me see. I'll, I'll, yeah, Lisa followed up and said that, uh, who, who did we lose? Is that me? I, did we lose me? Am I here? Can you hear me? You're here. Yep. Oh, Angel's gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Lisa, um, you, you went to... Hebrews 11, and of course we know that that's the faith chapter, and 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 it's I don't what is it called like the Hall of Fame of gr- people with great faith that list of I don't there's yeah. a, there's a name for these people or you know, Hall of Fame I guess but yeah it is uh, Hall yeah, of these faith. People, okay um, the point is oh we did we lose somebody else oh no yeah. we lost Heather too what's going on Ben I have no idea it's not us. Yeah, they'll be back. Okay. All right. Um, you know, it kind of threw me off. Uh, oh yeah. Um, so the point that uh, at, when this dispute was going on um, in 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 CES, uh, um, um, the one side was was said that it, it's impossible for a true believer to ever doubt or or lose their faith. Uh, and and uh, then the other position that I hold and uh, that we we as a church uh, hold and, and we insist we mu- we must all agree on this is that, that uh, you can be a true believer and even though you're truly saved, you could have a a, a moment or even a period of time where you have uh, your faith wanes or is lost and, and doesn't, doesn't mean you, you never really got saved. So that was the the uh, the basis of the arguments uh, and the reason it's important is because uh, there's the, the fifth tenet of Calvinism is uh, the P in TULIP is perseverance of the saints but um, m- many people if they haven't studied it they think it's persevering in good works but there's two parts to it and that is perseverance in the faith and in good works so uh, the Calvinist position is that if you're truly saved uh, your faith will persevere. You'll never, you never have a doubt, and that you'll, you'll, you'll be successful at doing good works and getting sin out of your life, which these things are uh, putting a burden on us that we have to keep, stay faithful and we have to do good works, and, rather than uh, having it. Hey, Jesus did it all for us. That's why it's a, a critical um, uh, issue to get right. Uh, because it becomes faith plus some kind of work. You have to work at your faith or work at your works. Um, but you do have, uh, in the, the, the people who are in chapter 11, these people truly had great faith. That's why they're there. That's why they're cited. But we have uh, uh, examples of, at least I think that Abraham, uh, he, he did have... Uh, uh, that some doubts, maybe one or more more times he's doubted, uh, but he obviously he was saved. Even though, so, that's why it's uh, Abraham is an important uh, subject. Uh, did he did he ever 
did his was his faith perfect from the time he first believed that did, uh, because that would support the side that we'll see here abraham never doubted but we say no abraham is an example of someone who's saved and yet they did have a doubt uh, now there's other examples too that we we would bring up in our argument uh, to support our side and uh, but the two there's two cases i want to get your thoughts on uh, and that is um john the baptist we know that when he was in jail and there was a time where he asked the question about hey go to jesus and ask him if he's really the one that that you know we we said he is and uh so the question is, is, was that an expression of his, his doubt uh, or John the Baptist uh, or something else going on there? And then some people, I won't mention a name, but, but there was one individual who was even arguing that uh, Jesus doubted in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, so I, I'd like to get everybody's short uh, answer on that, if you, if you can. Uh, did Jesus doubt God uh, in the garden, or and did uh, did John the Baptist doubt that Jesus was really the the promised uh, Savior? Anybody want to? Each person, if you give me your answer to that too. Okay. Well, I like to say concerning John. Before I forget, uh, I think that that passage is not even. It's not even when he says, "Are, are you the one, or, sh or should we look for another?" When he sends his servants to ask that. I don't think he's actually asking that because he doubted who Jesus was. He's the one who prophesied who Jesus was. He was full of the Holy Ghost. I think what was happening there is John knew he was about to die. And in a roundabout way, what he is asking is if the Lord is going to deliver him from death. That's what I perceive what was going on there. Um, and it's also that's also based on what Jesus answered was, which I don't recall in full right now. So I won't even try to quote it. But I really think that's what was going on. John didn't want to die. And he's asking, <laughs> basically, are you going to deliver me from what's about to happen to me? But um, anyway, uh, going on with uh, what I wanted to answer to about something I wanted to make sure I pointed out when you read in Hebrews 11. Uh, because there's this concept that the old covenant saints, and I can't stand it. I don't know where it came from, but I hate it. It's this concept that they did not understand that there was a Christ coming. And that's not true. They they make it about their faith. For example, this is a perfect example of the faith of Abraham concerning Isaac. That his, it was his believing God concerning Isaac that saved him. No, it was his believing God that the Christ was going to come through Isaac, okay? So it, and I'm going to prove it with this one passage of scripture here. With um, and, and you can see the other scriptures. Remember, Jesus said, uh, search and look the scriptures, for there are those that testify of me. For example, in Isaiah, uh, perfect description of Calvary, as though Isaiah was seated at the foot of the cross, recording what he has witnessed that hasn't happened yet, okay? But here's another passage that, that offers a second witness, which would be if you were in Hebrews 11 and you go down and it, I'll start at verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he has come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Esteeming, this is the critical verse here to let you know they understood there was a Messiah coming and they believed it. Esteeming the reproach of who? Christ. Now he's talking about Moses. But yet Paul writing this says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Now, this is something I don't understand. These people miss, and they'll they'll make it about 
their dedication to God in faith. But they forget that they were looking forward to the promised Messiah. This is how they were justified by faith. And it's the same thing with the people who beheld Christ as he walked this earth. They had to look and see and go based on the old covenant and what was promised. This is the one. And now we, as saints of God in faith, looking black and uh, back, and we also uh, get even another blessing because Jesus declared, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. So we look back. Having never seen it with our eyes, based on the scripture, based on the revelation of Christ through this book, we receive the gospel, we believe, and we're justified by faith, by placing faith in his son. It has always been about Christ. It is He is the dividing line, because I'm going to keep reminding y'all, we go from Genesis, the beginning, to the book of the revelation of who? That's the whole name. The book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. All right. Amen. Thanks. Thank you, sister. Okay. Amen. Uh, anybody want to say more about the original question or my follow-up questions now? I do. I do. Um, I would like to just say on Sister Lisa's thing, uh, a comment that she made. Oh my goodness! So spot on. They were not looking at their own circumstances and and believing necessarily for this one event to happen in my life. They were like you said, they were looking past that event to the Messiah. And I think that that was very, very, very well stated. Thank you so much for that, Sister Lisa. Um, I wanted to share um, about John the Baptist. Um, I think that. I, I found the verse that Sister Lisa was talking about um, where uh, she, what Jesus answered. And it's Matthew 11, verse four. It says that Jesus told Jesus told um, John's disciples, go and tell John the things which you see and hear the blind see the lame walk. The leopards are cleansed. The deaf hear the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. At the time that John was in prison getting ready to die, there was offense over Jesus because they were saying that John um, didn't eat and drink. And they said that he had a demon and Jesus came eating and drinking and they called him a drunkard and, and a friend of sinners. So he basically, Jesus is answering John's question by saying, yes, I am without saying, yes, I am. But here's the proof that I am. And tying into with, into what sister Lisa said about it being John looking for some sort of confirmation before he died that that um jesus was the one who would who would you know make this better for him i don't know sister lisa had better words for it but anyway um is where he says where jesus says the dead are raised up so for me that that ties perfectly in i think i think that you hit the nail on the head with that sister lisa Oh, I'm sorry. And also um, about Jesus. I'm sorry. Also about um, Jesus doubting in the garden. I do not see doubt. I see desperation because Jesus was a man as much as we are humans. We are men, mankind. And because of that nature that Jesus had, it, I don't believe that it was doubt as much as a desire to avoid pain if possible, even though dread. dread. Yeah. There you go. There's the word dread. Yes, it was dread. It was not doubt. Yeah, because in Hebrews, remember in Hebrews, it points back and it talks about we have not a high priest who's not in touch with the feeling of our infirmity. Well, this is one thing you're seeing in the Gospel of John, the 17th chapter. He did not doubt. He was not afraid to go to his death or any of that. 
what's going on is he, Jesus is showing you one that he didn't have a death wish like he was crazy. OK, because there are people trying to make Jesus out to be crazy for being. Remember, he said, you know, it, this this cup, shall I not drink it? For this cause, I came into the world. So we already know he knew he was born to die. He knew where he was going. He knew what his purpose and mission was. And it was it was to go conquer the one who had the power of death and whoop his behind. He had to enter into the realm of the dead. And that <laughs> he knew what he was doing. We know that by other scriptures, like the one that said, for if they, speaking of the devils, had known he was the Lord from glory, they would not have crucified him. OK, <laughs> so it's the greatest sneak attack in history. People talk about like uh uh, Troy and uh, the Trojan horse and all. No, the greatest sneak attack in history was this. <laughs> they didn't even see it coming. It was a mystery to them. He fooled them. Double they think they winning. Yeah, they think they winning. They had Jesus up on the cross. They think we won. We got him. And then Jesus is he's like uh, th literally declaring, making decrees on Calvary in agony, making decrees like to the thief today. You will be with me in paradise. And imagine the Roman soldiers standing there going, this man, it, it, even in agony, is making decrees like this. That's why one of them standing there goes, surely he was the son of God. So, you know, all of this stuff is as a witness to us. If we're paying attention, sometimes maybe we just need to, to close our eyes. I mean, I know you can't read and close your eyes at the same time. But if you close your eyes and imagine that you are witnessing what is being said. You pick up on nuances that you don't see if you just sit there and just read it. Because there is an experience going on right there revealed in the scriptures for us to behold the magnitude and the glory of God that is being poured out. Even as he is judging, like he said, now is the prince of this world judged. Satan's already been judged. This is why the demons and the devils hate him. And this is why they blaspheme, and you see it everywhere in the media and all this, the children of darkness, just with all their blasphemy, because they cannot be redeemed. When I say they, I'm talking about the devils, the fallen ones. They cannot be redeemed. They have been judged. Their designation is damnation. They have an appointment with the lake of fire. He came to save man. And you are the prize, beloved. You are the prize. He who dies with Jesus wins. We all, if the Lord tarries, we all have to meet death. Everyone who has went on before us, that was the designation. But if they died with Christ, they won. They beat the game. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, uh, welcome back, uh, Angel. Uh, uh, ben, um, go ahead. Let's see what Sorry you Sorry about to say. that. That area. Yeah, in case you're in case you missed it, we're talking about uh, did uh, John the Baptist have a doubt and uh, and did uh, Jesus have a doubt in the Garden of Gethsemane? Uh, it's a follow up right. question I asked. Uh, ben, okay. Ben, go ahead. Okay, a couple points real quick. Um, again, Abraham. I think again the 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 verses where the Bible, like Romans and Hebrews, were mentioning Abraham. Again, I I, don't, I think it's the idea is you know it, like you said, uh, Luke, it's it's the Hall of Faith chapter, uh, not the Hall of Fame, but the Hall of Faith chapter, and it's not to to say, oh, uh, you know, if you if you are truly born again, th this is what your life will look like, or this is what how your faith will exemplify itself. No, he he's saying those he's saying those things is that you know th those are people we should look up to, and we should uh, strive to be like them, uh, those who with patient endurance. Inherit the promise says plural, not promise, but promise says. And again, I think it's it's in relation to in Hebrews with ruling and reigning of Christ and, and just rewards in general, not the promise of eternal life. And and again, uh, in Romans as well, it's not to say that oh, your faith must be exactly like Abraham's, uh, unwavering and and uh, unfaltering. No, it's to summarize, to restate, and conclude that the example of Abraham's uh, justification by faith. Um, is to prove again that's how someone is justified before God, not to say, oh, it must be constant or the quality of it. It's just he's emphasizing that example that Abraham, you know, before he was circumcised, etc., even for any law whatsoever, he was justified before God. Um, and also, too, a lot of people say, oh, well, you may doubt, but you may you may doubt God, but you won't doubt your salvation. Well, oh, that's convenient. 
uh, how 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 can I have any faith in my if, in my salvation if I don't trust God? If God's not going to change or oh, uh, good point. point. Yeah, it, it's it's a silly. Um, and again, I do believe someone has to be fully persuaded, but it, it it's a momentary. It you have to be fully fully persuaded in the saving message. Uh, and and it but it it doesn't have to. It can last a nanosecond in the moment. The nanosecond you believe it, you're saved eternally. Um. So again, I I, I think that um, that, that people abuse use and abuse those things. But to get to your point about uh, John the Baptist, I absolutely I have to disagree, Lisa. I don't think he was asked. John the Baptist was concerning uh, his uh, deliverance, his personal deliverance from jail, because the context uh, in uh, for example, it's in a couple places. But Matthew eleven chapter uh, Matthew eleven verse two it says, and when John had heard him in prison about the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, capital one, or do we look for another? So I, I think, again, John was asking, asked, sent his disciples to say, Are you the Messiah, essentially, or do we look for another? And then even Jesus' response doesn't suggest that, uh, that there's any, he's, he's looking for personal deliverance from jail. He's saying, No, I am the coming one by evidence of the prophesied work that would uh, Isaiah prophesy about the works of Christ. And, and, and that's why Jesus responded. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have, got, have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. So again, the question and the response, again, I believe John did have cons uh, doubts about it. Again, even after... After he said, uh, I, you know, I'm not worthy to un 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 unstrap his sandal, uh, you know, and, and behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world. I, after he made those declarations, I believe he did doubt. Uh, I think that's a good example. With regards to Jesus doubting, absolutely never. No way whatsoever Jesus doubted. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, the Bible says anything not done in faith is sin. And so if Jesus doubted uh, God... Who, he's God, he doubted himself. I mean, but uh, if Jesus doubted, then Jesus sinned. And, a, and a, a Savior that sinned cannot save. So I think that's a serious error. And um, absolutely not. That, that There's no way that he ever doubted. Jesus never sinned. No way, no how. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, look at my shirt first of all here. Yeah, in case you didn't see it already. Woohoo! One way to heaven, that's Jesus. Okay, um, well, I'll give you the official answers. No, um, my answers. Uh, good one, Lick. <laughs> I, I think I that uh, I originally thought that Jesus, uh, that um, John the Baptist doubted. He had second thoughts since he was in jail. It wasn't working out the way he thought it was going to, and he started wondering, hey, was, was I wrong? Uh, but uh, I... Because of the, the, the dispute and the, I needed to study it further, I, I ended up coming to the other conclusion that uh, I don't think that John did doubt. I, I think that, what, first of all, the scriptures tell us that, that John was told by God that uh, when he sees uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, like a dove uh, above a particular person, that's how you would be able to identify the the uh, uh, the Messiah. Uh, so that's what uh, that's what God said would be the proof that Jesus is the one. And then, of course, we know at the baptism of Jesus, that's exactly what what happened. And and so you have John the Baptist seeing this was the fulfillment of what God told him to look for. So he identified him. This he's the one. He's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he uh, he also uh, was witness of the the triune Godhead at that very time. He, here he has Jesus in the flesh, the the Son of God, God in the flesh, and then you have the Holy Spirit in the manner of a dove uh, uh, ascending above him, and then you have God the Father there also speaking to him. Behold, this is my beloved Son. Uh, so. Uh, with that kind of um, a sign, proof from God, 
Uh, I find it impossible to think that uh, what was going on here was that John actually was doubting uh, with that kind of proof. I think it was impossible for him to doubt. So what was happening um, in jail? Um, I, I don't think that John was uh, doubting, but for the benefit of the disciples of John, who were torn, they, they were, they didn't know what to do. You know, they were disciples of John, but now that we've got Jesus and, uh, and so, and now John's in, in jail. And so they were probably having doubts who didn't know what to do. And so I believe John asked the question, uh, go ask him this, not because he would, he didn't know, but because he wanted them to hear in Jesus from Jesus' own mouth, his answer. So that they could have the confidence that John had. Uh, now, in the garden, uh, I agree that that was not uh, that was not doubt. Uh, God, God can't cannot doubt. God knows, and, and so that that was just great distress. And, and what, what did you call it? Uh, um, the word uh, um, trepidation. Despair, I mean, despair, dread, yeah, despair. Because I mean, he knew very well every detail of what he with what was coming in a matter of a couple of hours, how much he was going to suffer. And so that's that's why he was saying, Father, if there's any other way that we could do this, spare, spare me this, if there's any other way, but if not, thy will be done. But it wasn't that he doubted and didn't understand that, that know the truth. Um, all right, um, uh, anybody wanna say more on any of these three? Uh, John the Baptist, Jesus in the garden, and Abraham, uh, as far as doubt. Okay, well, we spent quite a bit of time on this question. I think it was very uh, great uh, discussion, and I think it's very worthwhile and important for us to understand these things. Um,